Good evening, uh, dear colleagues, friends, and uh, patients with asthma. Welcome to this uh, ERS webinar, which is organized by the European Respiratory Society, the ERS. And today it's the uh, World Asthma Day. And therefore, today we focus in this uh, ERS webinar on the interaction between COVID-19, so coronavirus-induced disease 19, and asthma. And first of all, we want to express our deepest respect and also a big thank you to all of you who care for patients with COVID-19 and patients with asthma. And there are more than 3.5 million uh, patients already um, worldwide with, with COVID disease. And this is, of course, a sub-estimate. And today we will uh, focus on, on asthma because it's World Asthma Day. And uh, th this has important implications for the management of asthma. Um, we have a panel of three speakers today. So I'm Guy Brussel. I'm a respiratory physician at Ghent University Hospital in Ghent in Belgium. And we have the pleasure to welcome also Antonio Spanefello, who is professor at the University of Varese Como in Italy, northern Italy. And he is the head of the ERS Assembly 5, the Assembly on Airway Diseases, Asthma and CPD. And then we have also Stephanie Eyre. She is uh, living in the UK and she is a patient with asthma. She has asthma already from childhood uh, onwards. And she is a very active um, respiratory patient advocate of the European Lung Foundation, ELF, the European Lung Foundation and the European Respiratory Society closely uh, work together. And so um, that's very important for the optimal care and, and outcomes of patients with asthma. And you as an audience throughout the entire webinar can ask questions using the Q&A um, link at the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to ask your questions and, and we will answer them uh, during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Stephanie will ask uh, several questions which were put forward by patients with asthma. So if we go then to the next slide, we, we start with the most important take-home messages. And so there are five take-home messages. First of all, there's reassuring news for patients with asthma that if your asthma is well controlled, this is not associated with an increased risk of severe COVID-19. Then secondly, use of inhaled corticosteroids in subject with asthma prevents extubations. This is very well known but it's also associated by reduced expression of ACE2. So that's the receptor for the COVID, uh, coronavirus. And thus this might be also uh, beneficial in, in uh, treating patients with asthma with inhaled corticosteroids in reducing the risk of infection by coronavirus. This needs of course to be confirmed in observational studies, but this is very reassuring. So to our patient with asthma, Please continue the use of your inhaled corticosteroids also during this COVID pandemic. Third message is concerning smoking. Smoking increases the risk of severe COVID-19, and it is associated with increased expression of the receptor ACE2 for the coronavirus, both in the airways and in the lungs. And so then we have the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, which has, of course, an impact on severe asthma care. And as a last point, there are many randomized control trials now evaluating the efficacy and safety of either antiviral drugs or immunomodulative treatments for COVID-19. It's very important that you as a respiratory physician or as a patient contribute to these uh, studies because this is uh, the key uh, manner to demonstrate efficacy and safety uh, of novel drugs, which are really uh, required to, to treat patients with COVID-19. So if we go then to uh, the overview of the presentations, I will address the clinical presentation shortly of COVID-19 and the current management of asthma. Then we will address the question, are asthma patients at increased risk of COVID-19? And uh, give a short overview of the treatment of both asthma and COVID-19. 
Then Antonio Spanavello will uh, give you an overview of the epidemiology of asthma and COVID-19. Uh, the pathogenesis and the, isenthilic, the role of isenthilic inflammation and on the one hand asthma and in the other hand COVID-19. And then also give you an overview of the guidelines of COVID-19 and its impact on severe asthma care. And then Stephanie uh, will ask the questions and provide the perspectives of the patient with asthma. So if we start with uh, the conflict of interest uh, disclosure, that's uh, the usual suspects you see, but my main interest is asthma, is GINA, the Global Initiative for Asthma, and the ERS, the European Respiratory Society. So the clinical presentation of COVID-19 so the, the eight symptoms which are recognized by the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, are fever, cough, shortness of breath, chills, muscle pain, sore throat, headache, and the loss of taste or the loss of smell. So these symptoms, they appear approximately five to seven days after exposure to the virus but the duration of the latency period varies between two days and 14 days. There are emergency warning signs, which are uh, extremely important. And so if you as a patient, or as if you see as a physician, one of these uh, warning signs, then uh, there is of course an emergency. And so these warning signs are trouble breathing, persistent pain or pressure in the chest, a new confusion, and the bluish lips or face. Of course, this is not an all-inclusive list, but if you as a patient ha uh, has one or, or more of these warning signs, you should uh, uh, seek immediately medical attention and go to the uh, emergency department. It's very important to realize that COVID-19 disease consists of several stages, so one, two, and three. So the first stage is early in the infection, is dominated by the viral response phase in the early days uh, of, of the disease, so the first five to seven days. It's uh, characterized by fever, mild constitutional symptoms, and dry cough. In the lab, you see lymphopenia, but then of, in, in the majority of patients, this is the only uh, stage. And so it's a mild disease, especially in young adults uh, and, and, and children uh, without any comorbidities. In 10 to 20% of the patients, the disease evolves to the second stage, which is the pulmonary phase. And this is characterized by dyspnea, by shortness of breath and also by hypoxia, which is worsening from stage 2A to stage 2B. And here you have abnormal chest imaging, either on the chest X-ray or on CT scan of the chest. Uh, of course, you should exclude bacterial pneumonia and the procalcitonin is low to normal. And then in a small subgroup of patients, three to 5% of the patients, there, uh, there can be a hypersystemic uh, inflammation, which is stage three. And here you, you see then the development of ARDS, the adult re uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, sometimes shock and cardiac failure. And here the inflammatory markers in the, in the blood are very high, including CRP, LDH, interleukin-6, D-dimers, ferritin. So these inflammatory market markers are uh, in a subgroup of patients, very elevated, and this is the hyperinflammatory phase, which is uh, often uh, leading to respiratory failure and the need for mechanical uh, uh, ventilation and intubation. Here you see the uh, early stage pneumonia of COVID-19 with the ground glass opacities on, on CT scan, sometimes the crazy paving pattern on, on CT scan. Uh, and this can evolve to an advanced stage pneumonia where you have uh, either ground glass opacities or consolidation, but now diffuse, bilateral. And this can lead, of course, to uh, ARDS, the uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, so that's uh, in a short uh, uh, clinical presentation of the COVID-19. 
Let's uh, refresh the, the current GINA guidelines for the management of asthma in 2020. And the goals of the, the management of asthma are mainly to prevent asthma exacerbations and especially to prevent asthma mortality. In 2015, 400,000 patients with asthma died due to an asthma attack worldwide. Currently, there are more than 300,000 deaths due to the COVID uh, pandemic. So but we should not forget that asthma can kill, especially if asthma is uncontrolled. And here you see the, uh, the fundamental change of asthma management since 2019, uh, according to Gina. So Gina no longer recommends treating adults or adolescents with asthma with short-acting bronchodilators alone. So with Saba alone, this is not longer recommended. And this is, has been the treatment for asthma for 50 years, especially in so-called mild asthma. But since also mild uh, asthmatics are at risk of severe exacerbations and asthma death, the GINA now recommends that all patients with asthma should receive either symptom-driven in mild asthma or daily corticosteroid-containing inhalers, mainly to reduce the risk of severe exacerbations. And we have vast evidence in favor of this uh, based on four randomized control trials in adults and adolescents. We are looking forward to similar evidence in, in children with asthma, so below the age of 12. And so here you see the well-known stepwise uh, treatment algorithm for asthma. And you see that for the preferred controller, we have now upfront the possibility already in step one and step two to treat patients with low dose ICS formatrol used as needed. So when the patient has symptoms of shortness of breath, of course, then an, an alternative is the daily low dose inhaled corticosteroid in patients with mild asthma step two. But we all know that the adherence to this is low because the patients are uh, oligosymptomatic. And then in step three, four and five, moderate to severe asthma, we uh, advise, we recommend maintenance treatment with inhaled corticosteroids, uh, long acting beta 2 agonist combination inhalers in one inhaler, either low dose in step three, medium dose step four, and high dose step five. Um, it's important that low dose oral corticosteroids are now only considered as a second choice, as an other controller option in step five, if the patient is not well controlled despite uh, add-on treatment with LAMA, such as theotropium, and the uh, availability of uh, anti bodies against uh, type 2 cytokines, monoclonal antibodies such as uh, anti-IgE, anti-L5, anti-L5 receptor, or anti-4 receptor. The, these are preferred uh, compared to the oral corticosteroids because the antibodies have specific mechanisms of action and have uh, very few side effects. The third uh, topic, uh, a very important question is, are asthma patients at increased or maybe decreased risk of COVID-19 uh, infection. And once they are infected, does asthma make the, their disease COVID-19 worse? These are two important questions. And so in an uh, interesting review uh, just published in the UP Metro Journal, it's uh, mentioned that there are three phases where either disease asthma or the treatment with inhaled corticosteroids could have an effect. So if the SARS coronavirus 2 is inhaled, and then the a previous healthy person or a patient with asthma can become infected, but remain asymptomatic or have only mild symptoms, or become more uh, symptomatic and have this uh, early stage disease with cough and fever during five to seven days. And then in a subgroup of patients, there, there will be a progression to the pneumonia, so the to pulmonary entrance and dyspnea, and this can either recover or become even more prominent and, and problematic, leading to ARDS, and then uh, needing mechanical ventilation at the intensive uh, care unit and probably lead to death. So um, both the disease, asthma, and also the treatment with inhaled corticosteroids could have an effect on the risk of becoming infected, but also the risk of developing the disease once infected 
or uh, developing a more severe cause of the disease once uh, uh, developing COVID-19. Uh, unfortunately, this, uh, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, lumps all chronic airway diseases, both asthma and CPD and emphysema together in one item, which is called chronic lung disease. And if you compare patients who had not been hospitalized with those with more severe COVID disease, so needing hospitalization or even ICU admission, you see that the prevalence of chronic lung disease increases from 7% to 15% to 21%. And also the prevalence of smoking is also increased from two to four to 7%. But I think it's very important to make a distinction between on the one hand asthma and on the other hand, uh, CPD and, and, and smoking. So this is a complex slide, but let's focus on, on the one hand, the age of the adult patients, so below 64 or above 65, and then whether an underlying condition is present, yes or no. So, and then whether the patient needed to be hospitalized or admitted to the ICU. So if the patient, the adult patient is younger than 64, and has no underlying condition, only 2% uh, or less of these uh, patients need uh, ICU admission, and less than 6% uh, are hospitalized. Whereas if patients are uh, older than 65 years old uh, and have one or more of these underlying conditions, then up to 44% of these patients are admitted to the hospital, and up to 22% of the patients needed ICU admission. So it's clear that advanced age and the presence of comorbidities make COVID worse. But let's focus now on the first step of the infection, and that's the, uh, the time that the coronavirus, SARS-2, is binding to its receptor, and the receptor is ACE2, the angiotensin converting enzyme 2, which is expressed on many cells, but mainly epithelial cells in the upper and lower airways, in the lungs, and also in endothelial cells. And so when the coronavirus, the spike protein, so these keys which are uh, outreaching from the virus, bind to this receptor, to this uh, lock, this will then uh, lead to entry of the virus in the cell. Um, and so this is a very important uh, moment in the disease pathogenesis. Um, and so a very important paper just published by Michael Peters uh, and John Fahey in the Blue Journal, the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine, has shown that there is no difference in expression at the messenger RNA level in the receptor ACE2 between patients with asthma and healthy subjects in, in induced putin. This is a logarithmic scale, so there are no difference. The, the second uh, uh, gene which was uh, investigated was the transmembrane protease, uh, serine protein TMPRSS2, which is a protease which activates the spike protein on the coronavirus. And so um, faci facilitating the entry of the virus into the cells. And again, there is no difference in expression of that gene between asthmatics and healthy persons in induced putum. So that's very reassuring. And this is totally different from the expression of ICAM1, which is the intercellular adhesion molecule 1, which is uh, the receptor for the rhinovirus. And we all know that rhinovirus in healthy subjects will cause a common cold and will cause only mild symptoms of the upper airways for a few days. But in asthma patients, the rhinovirus will go down in the lower airways and uh, increase air inflammation and will induce asthma attacks. And so in patients with asthma, there is an increased expression of ICAM-1 in induced sputum compared to healthy individuals. So this is uh, very important that ACE2, the receptor for the SARS coronavirus 2, is not different between asthma and healthy subjects, totally different from ICAM1, the receptor for rhinovirus. And I apologize that the, the um, um, references is, is, is lacking in, in, in my view, but it's the, the, the blue journal, the, the, the paper by uh, Michael Peters, and so you see it in, in the full screen. And very interestingly is if you look at the ACE2 expression in, in induced sputum 
uh, of patients with asthma who were not treated with corticosteroids, then this, this is the, the reference. Uh, sorry, I will go back. Um, but patients who were treated with inhaled corticosteroids, either at a low dose or at a high dose, have a reduced expression of ACE2. So this suggests that possibly patients with asthma who are treated with inhaled corticosteroids have a reduced expression of ACE2, not only in, in, in the sputum, but maybe also in the airway epithelial cells. This needs to be confirmed at the, at the um, protein level. And similar results they show uh, of this protease, uh, which is um, uh, activating the uh, uh, S protein of, of the, the spike protein of the coronavirus, reduced expression by uh, um, treatment with inhaled corticosteroids. Um, a totally different story for smoking. You know that uh, current smokers, they have more uh, goblet cells, they have more, um, they have mucous hyperplasia. And these goblet cells, they produce a, a lot of ACE2, they express a lot of ACE2, also clip cells and other epithelial cells. But this is a single cell transcriptomic analysis of never smokers in green as compared with smokers, current smokers in, in brown. And so there's an increased expression of ACE2 in smokers in the airways. And this is uh, work by our group by, with uh, Meryl Jacobs and Ken Bracke in, in, in Ghent University Hospital in our department, investigating now the protein expression of ACE2 in the lung tissue of either never smokers uh, uh, in A, current smokers without CPD in B, and then patients with CPD in C and D. And so the dark brown color is the positive staining of, of ACE2 in the alveolar epithelial cells. And this is a clear increase in the expression of ACE2 in smokers and in patients with CPD. And if you look here at this logarithmic scale, and this is now the immunohistochemical staining, so at the protein level of ACE2, a clear increase in smokers compared to never smokers, and a further increase in patients with CPD, gold stage two, and even and gold stage four. So this is clearly that we need to separate asthma, non-smokers, allergic uh, airway inflammation versus the CPD patients, long-time smokers with, with CPD, in, in the expression of ACE2, and also in the risk of uh, severe COVID-19. Um, what are the implications uh, for the treatment of asthma? So we advise patients with asthma to continue taking their prescribed asthma medications, and particularly the inhaled corticosteroids. Inhaled corticosteroids are the cornerstone of treatment of asthma and should be continued uh, in patients with asthma even during these, this COVID-19 pandemic. Stopping inhaled corticosteroids often leads to dangerous worsening of asthma, Smoking cessation is important for all subjects and even more for asthmatics. But during this pandemic uh, of COVID-19, it's even more important. And then for patients with severe asthma, Antonio will go more deep in this. We should continue biologic therapy. Uh, there is the opportunity to self-administer now many of these monoclonal antibodies at home. And of course, for the few patients with severe asthma who are still on maintenance treatment with all corticosteroids, we should not suddenly stop this, but we should try to reduce the dose as much as possible, because in a patient with uncontrolled severe asthma and repetitive burst of our corticosteroids, or even maintenance treatment with all corticosteroids, this leads to obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and all these corticosteroid-induced comorbidities are risk factors for severe COVID-19. What about asthma action plans? So uh, the patients should have a written asthma action plan explaining why to uh, and when to increase the control and the relief of medication when their asthma worsens. If they have an asthma exacerbation, a short course of oral corticosteroids is still necessary. And then, of course, please avoid the use of uh, nebulizers because it has been shown during the first SARS epidemic in 2003-2004 that these 
nebulizers, they increase the risk of disseminating viruses to other patients and also to healthcare professionals. So please use the meter dose inhalers, the PMDIs, via a large spacer to treat patients during an acute exacerbation of asthma. And then finally, for the treatment of COVID-19, this is of course beyond the scope of this webinar, but it is heavily dependent on the phase, the stage of the disease. Antivirals will mostly be effective in the early stages of infection. And remember, tummy flu uh, for the treatment of, of flu of influenza, it needs to be administered within 12 to 24 hours after the onset of symptoms to be effective. And then in the patients who have a, a hyperinflammatory response within ARDS or also the stage 2B uh, pulmonary phase with uh, an ARDS due to an hyperinflammation, there anti um, interleukin-6, anti-interleukin-1, and other uh, immunomodulators could be of interest, but they need to be tested in randomized controlled trials because these are crucial to demonstrate the efficacy and the safety of these drugs, and this is uh, uh, key. And so in many countries, there are ongoing trials. Have a look at uh, clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, also inform at your ERS um, uh, and at your National Respiratory Society and participate in these trials to, to increase the numbers, to have sufficient power to demonstrate efficacy and safety of antiviral drugs and immunomodulatory treatments. So this is very important. Uh, and so we, we count on all of you to, to participate because we, knew, we need uh, uh, new treatments. So this is uh, my part on, on the clinical presentation and the management of asthma and COVID. And I hand now over to uh, Professor Antonio Spanivello in, in, in Italy, who will uh, provide you an update on the hypnology and, and, and the uh, guidelines. Please, Antonio. Uh, thank you, Guy, and uh, thank uh, all uh, ERS uh, uh, staff uh, for uh, uh, organizing this uh, very interesting uh, webinar. Uh, I'm uh, going uh, uh, to move uh, uh, on the next uh, three topics. The first one uh, is uh, the incidence of uh, asthma in uh, patients affected by uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, infection. And uh, we know the importance of their, and the role of a viral respiratory infection in asthma. And uh, for patients with asthma, viral respiratory tract infection uh, uh, can have uh, a, a strong uh, effect uh, on the expression of the disease and the loss of control, mainly due to the increase of inflammation and increase uh, of uh, hyper responsiveness. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, among uh, infection agents, Human rhinovirus, uh, uh, as you can see, are uh, the most uh, prevalent uh, in regard to asthma exacerbation. Uh, in the contrary, in this uh, uh, review article, coronavirus uh, is not uh, a higher frequency in uh, asthma exacerbation than the uh, control population. And uh, uh, in the previous, uh, is in line with uh, in. Uh, uh, with uh, this uh, uh, previous uh, paper where uh, uh, subjects uh, uh, presenting in an emergency room with uh, asthma exacerbation uh, had uh, uh, coronavirus in, in sputum induction in uh, uh, present just in 4% of samples uh, with uh, uh, an increase of uh, uh, neutrophilic inflammation. And uh, uh, about uh, the incidence, um, I have uh, selected uh, five uh, very recent uh, uh, report. The first one from China, from the court of uh, one, uh, where uh, no asthmatic patient uh, was identified in this report. Uh, and they analyzed just the hospitalized patients, uh, non-severe and severe patients, but non-hospitalized patients and uh, no asthmatic patient was identified in this report. Um, uh, from the same court from uh, China, from one, uh, 
uh, um, a little bit later, uh, uh, another group uh, published uh, um, a report from uh, um, almost uh, 600 patients. But also in this uh, uh, report, the prevalence uh, of asthma in uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, patients were only uh, less than 1%. And again, uh, the most uh, coexisting uh, uh, diseases uh, uh, are uh, in terms of incidence are diabetes and hypertension and cardiovascular diseases. Uh, Another interesting uh, report is that this prospective uh, case series involving patients with uh, another uh, disease, immunomediated inflammatory disease like uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, or psoriasis, or psoriasis arthritis, and uh, in, uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, disease. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, yes, and in, in uh, this is the table, and you can see. Uh, uh, also in this report, uh, there were not any uh, hospitalized patients with, uh, with asthma, but uh, uh, um, uh, with respect to the previous report, uh, the authors analyzed also the ambulatory patients and they found that uh, 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 15 patients with asthma were uh, infected by COVID-19, but uh, they didn't uh, uh, go to the hospital, they stay at home. And uh, 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 considering uh, the same area, New York area, but uh, 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 hospitalized patients uh, uh, with uh, COVID-19, uh, and uh, considering the number of patients, uh, this report is very good. This has been recently published in, uh, in JAMA, and they analyze uh, 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 also uh, chronic uh, respiratory disease, asthma, uh, COPD, and uh, sleep apnea. And they found uh, that uh, almost uh, 500 uh, patients with asthma were hospitalized uh, uh, for uh, uh, COVID-19 infection. And uh, uh, last uh, uh, report uh, was very recent, uh, uh, related to, to the critically ill patient uh, in uh, another region of uh, uh, USA, in the Seattle region, and uh, 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 analyzed the patient admitted to, to ICU with a, a confirmed infection of uh, uh, COVID-19. And in this uh, group uh, uh, of uh, a small group of patients, only 24, uh, three patients with asthma were admitted in ICU. And uh, uh, it's uh, uh, quite important to see that uh, uh, all uh, three patients uh, had uh, recently received uh, as uh, an outpatient uh, a systemic glucocorticoids for uh, uh, a presumed asthma uh, exacerbation. And uh, uh, finally, we'd like to show uh, data from Italy and uh, it's uh, uh, from uh, Italian uh, health uh, system. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, the report uh, described a characteristic of uh, almost 24,000 patients died for uh, uh, the uh, COVID-19 infection. Yesterday night uh, in Italy, the total number was uh, 29,000, unfortunately. And uh, if you uh, look at the uh, first 15 disease uh, 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 coexisting disease uh, in, uh, in a patient with infection, asthma was not reported. And uh, this is uh, just a, a national uh, uh, report, but I think it is very interesting because uh, the number of patients who died is very, very high. And uh, uh, so I can uh, uh, go to the next uh, uh, topic about the eosinophilic inflammation is a very interesting uh, a specific topic, uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can see that, uh, that uh, uh, asthma is a, a typical eosinophilic inflammation. It's been found a lot of eosinophils both in airways, in the sputum, in broca alveolar lavage, and in blood. And uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, some virus, again, uh, uh, rhinovirus, uh, in this uh, study, uh, uh, in comparison with uh, virus of influenza, some virus uh, induced increase of a uh, uh, general increase uh, in uh, uh, of uh, blood eosinophils. 
And uh, but uh, again, uh, if you go, if uh, we go to the uh, one uh, uh, group or one uh, court, uh, the uh, author uh, uh, show that uh, more than half of the uh, patients uh, had eosinopenia, not uh, uh, increase of eosinophils, with uh, an eosinophil count less than 0.02, so very very low level. And uh, I would like to show. Uh, is an adult uh, report of uh, just one patient of uh, our hospital. Is a male, uh, 84 years old, no smoker with uh, hypertension and atrial fibrillation as comorbidity. And uh, he was admitted to hospital for uh, uh, orthopedic surgery and then uh, was admitted to the rehabilitation unit. And uh, after a few days of the admission of the habitation uh, unit, started to have a fever and, uh, and uh, uh, an increase of uh, uh, leukocytes and neutrophils and an increase of uh, CRP. And uh, 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 they uh, started to have a, a decrease of eosinophils in the blood and uh, arrive almost to have a, almost a zero uh, level of, uh, of uh, eosinophils with a positive swab, remain uh, uh, nearby zero uh, for two weeks, uh, and then increase uh, the level of eosinophils uh, as a mark of viral infection resolution. And so in this, uh, uh, the, the hypothesis for these uh, authors in this paper is that uh, eosinopenia could be due to the sequestration of eosinophils by chemokines into the inflammation sites. Uh, uh, however, in uh, uh, the authors, uh, in this uh, 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 report, uh, uh, demonstrated that uh, in two findings of two uh, uh, autopsies of uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome uh, uh, of uh, COVID-19, uh, there was uh, uh, an interstitial chronic inflammation uh, compared mainly by, uh, composed by mainly of uh, lymphocytes, but no eosinophils and neutrophil were identified. And so I think that the sequestration of eosinophils uh, does not seem uh, occurring uh, in, uh, in uh, these uh, two post mortem uh, reports. And so uh, we discussed uh, with, uh, with uh, Yi last week uh, a very, very interesting hypothesis. They are uh, studying this in a uh, in, uh, uh, Ghent uh, um, uh, lab. Uh, an hypothesis is that the decrease of blood eosinophils, eosinopenia, in uh, COVID is due to the secondary hemophagocytosis, due to, to the cytokine uh, storm, uh, like uh, interleukin 6, uh, TNF, interleukin 1, in severe COVID. COVID. And the macrophages are too strongly activated and uh, phagocytes, eosinophils, and neutrophils, but in contrast, lymphocytes and monocytes decrease uh, in the blood uh, in uh, COVID infection due to massive uh, migration into the lung. It's a very intriguing uh, hypothesis. And the same hypothesis are related also to patellet uh, created uh, a more, uh, uh, a reduction of patellet uh, in, uh, in these, uh, in these uh, patients. So very intriguing, uh, very interesting hypothesis that will be uh, uh, analyzed in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the next future. And finally, uh, I would like to uh, summarize uh, some uh, important topics uh, 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 in uh, two uh, guidelines, uh, uh, recently published on uh, uh, COVID-19 and severe asthma. The first one uh, is uh, uh, the uh, NICE guideline. And the second one is uh, you can find in uh, uh, the update 2020 of the G9 pages uh, uh, 1718. You can find uh, a very interesting uh, part related to COVID-19 infection. Uh, what about the, the NICE guideline? Uh, the purpose uh, is to maximize the safety uh, of a patient with severe asthma during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, and uh, uh, the recommendations are based uh, on evidence and the expert opinion. The most important topic, uh, the suggestion is, uh, first of all, to communicate with patients, 
help to alleviate uh, any type of anxiety and fear because the patient have uh, anxiety and fear when they have uh, uh, a COVID-19 infection. Uh, to continue, the suggestion is important to continue taking their regular medicines, to continue to using inhaled corticosteroid and biological treatment. In this case, uh, if they suggest if it is possible to train for self-administered and if it is possible uh, to be treated uh, in the clinic or at home. And again, not, uh, the suggestion is not to share their, uh, their inhalers and uh, clean equipment uh, like a spacer and peak flow meter. And uh, uh, an important uh, suggestion and topic is uh, to, uh, uh, carry, uh, to carry out a bronchoscopy and uh, 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 spirometry just for urgent cases. And uh, if the results uh, have a direct impact on patient care. If not, uh, it, it, uh, uh, it's better do not uh, perform spirometry and bronchoscopy because uh, they have a potential to spread uh, COVID-19. And uh, finally, they suggest to minimize face-to-face -face, uh, uh, contact. Uh, uh, and uh, if you organize a face-to-face -face appointment to first screen them by telephone, and to make sure they have not uh, uh, symptoms of COVID uh, uh, epidemia and uh, ask a patient to attend appointment with no more than one family member and minimize the time in waiting uh, area. Are very, very uh, practical suggestions, very useful for patients uh, and for uh, workers as well. And uh, as a uh, uh, guy said, uh, Guy said before, uh, also Gina Guideline. Uh, uh, present an interim guidance on uh, asthma management, uh, and they suggest to continue taking uh, asthma medication, to have a written asthma action plan, uh, to avoid uh, use of nebulizer, as uh, he said before, and uh, uh, finally, uh, uh, sorry, to use uh, uh, spirometry and uh, to use the hygiene uh, 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 procedure as uh, uh, demonstrating this historical picture of ladies uh, wearing uh, a surgical mask during uh, the uh, pandemic, influenza pandemic, uh, 100 years uh, ago. And so I have just fin I finished my presentation and I give the floor to Stephanie to start uh, the patient perspectives uh, and uh, question from uh, the patient uh, uh, side. Thank you very much for your attention. Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio, and thank you, Guy, for the presentation so far and for preparing all of the information. Um, I have found it quite reassuring and informative as a patient, so thank you. Thank you to everyone who's joined the webinar, especially to the clinicians who are working with COVID-19 patients, and as always, thank you to doctors who are working with asthma patients as well. These questions have been gathered from the, um, through the European Lung Foundation um, with asthma patients and members of patients groups um, for their most pressing questions. Um, so let's start with the first question. Um, how can I tell if it is my asthma or COVID-19 how do I know when to take prednisolone if I can't tell the difference? Yes, yeah, very good question, Stephanie. It's very difficult because uh, uh, we receive a lot of uh, similar questions from the patient during uh, this period. And uh, I think that, the, the, to be honest, the symptoms are quite different uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, fever, high temperature, the, as uh, we said before, uh, the loss of smell, loss of taste, uh, uh, the um, uh, the cough, uh, the breathless. Uh, I, I know that the cough, the breathless, uh, for these two symptoms, there is a possible overlap. Uh, but the cough uh, and the, uh, the breathless are quite different. Uh, for instance, uh, the patient uh, uh, don't report a wheezing. Uh, that is typical for uh, uh, asthma, for asthma symptoms. And uh, uh, the, 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 the real suggestion is to communicate uh, 
to uh, with, with the doctor to explain very well the symptoms. And uh, I think that uh, also to ask uh, him uh, if uh, it is necessary to take a prednisolone or, or a corticosteroid related to for asthma symptoms. And uh, because uh, for asthma symptoms is, uh, is uh, uh, very well demonstrated the effect of oral corticosteroid that is not uh, uh, still uh, uh, demonstrated uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, some patients that use uh, uh, oral corticosteroid, but uh, we have not uh, now uh, 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 a, uh, a clinical trial and uh, a randomized clinical trial to demonstrate the real efficacy of uh, oral corticosteroid in uh, uh, COVID-19 infection. Thank so you. the suggestion is uh, if you have one of these symptoms, please communicate with uh, your uh, GP because it's the best way to uh, uh, solve the problem. Okay, thank you. The next question is, I have had COVID-19, so somebody's already had it, and I'm experiencing breathing difficulties afterwards. What should I do? Okay, I, I think that uh, it's possible to have breathless, and, uh, and to have dyspnea because uh, 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 if you have a more severe uh, COVID-19, uh, you could have uh, some problem in the gas exchange uh, in the alveolar uh, part of uh, our, our uh, uh, lung. And so I think that these uh, can create a, a decrease of oxygenation and, uh, and the breath and, and dyspnea. I think that uh, 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 as uh, suggested before, we can start the proper treatment. I know that uh, uh, we have not a randomized clinical trial, but there are some uh, treatment uh, uh, I have demonstrated a, a good efficacy. But my suggestion, if you have breathless, uh, please uh, start also exercise training. Uh, 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 if you can, uh, a rehabilitation program, the role of uh, a respiratory therapist is very, very important is, uh, in this part, uh, uh, in the post-acute uh, uh, part of the COVID uh, epidemia. And I think that uh, uh, if you have not uh, the, the rehabilitation, make uh, uh, some training exercise with the proper treatment, pharmacological treatment. Brilliant, thank you. Does COVID-19 cause permanent lung, lung damage and breathlessness? And can it reduce lifespan of people who have recovered from the disease? Yeah, thank you. Uh, is this similar of the previous question? I mean, my, my, my answer, because I think that uh, you, we don't know because uh, we don't know the, the, the permanent, we don't know if uh, some uh, important uh, damage uh, we, can, we, have, we can see in uh, the patient. Uh, uh, give before show the uh, CT scan for these patients. Uh, probably the lung damage uh, is, is uh, 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 an important tool, but uh, we don't know if uh, uh, it's permanent because uh, we can uh, follow the patients in the future. But uh, if uh, there is some damage, again, uh, uh, the suggestion is uh, to select the proper treatment, uh, to check the proper treatment uh, if you uh, have uh, asthma, you can continue the asthma treatment and for uh, the quality of life uh, to uh, ameliorate the quality of life, uh, please uh, make uh, exercise training and uh, rehab program. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Antonio. The, I have some more questions relating to severe asthma that Guy is now going to answer. Thank you, Guy. The first one is um, from a patient with severe asthma, do they have a greater risk for severe or acute COVID-19 than somebody would with moderate or mild asthma? So thank you, Stephanie. This is, of course, a new disease. And so uh, at this moment, we still have little evidence. Uh, but to my opinion, if a patient with severe asthma is well controlled, the risk for severe COVID should not be greater than in a patient with moderate or mild asthma. Of course, we know that severe asthmatics are often older. 
than patients with mild to moderate asthma. And so age is a very important uh, uh, risk factor. So we should always compare an asthma patient from the same with a, a person from the same gender and same age as a reference. But uh, if, if asthma, even severe asthma, is well controlled and the patient has no comorbidity such as uh, diabetes, uh, heart failure, then he or she should not have a greater risk for severe COVID than an age and gender matched uh, individual. Brilliant, thank you. Um, what about patients who are taking um, biologics or on biologic treatment? Are they so, at higher risk? So currently, we don't have any data on this in the field of, of asthma, severe asthma. But um, I again, I assume that patients are not at a, a significantly increased risk uh, if they are on a biologic. And there are some questions already also appearing from, from the audience because and Antonio showed that in patients with severe COVID, there are uh, decreased isenfil levels in the blood, sometimes even uh, uh, severe eosinopenia, so very low levels of blood isenfils. But this is only a sign of the severity of the disease, such as also lymphopenia. Uh, and this is not proving that this biomarker is really the maker of the disease. So this is totally different from the patients with severe isenfilic asthma who are treated with either mepolizumab, nucala, or benralizumab, fazendra, or resolizumab, Cairo. These um, monoclonal antibodies, they reduce blood isenfil levels, but this is their mode of action to treat patients with severe isenfilic asthma. And um, personally, I, I've, I have seen a patient which I treat already many years for severe isenfilic asthma um, with benradizumab and who had an, um, a proven COVID infection, but it was a mild infection and the CT scan was totally normal and he had normal blood gases and so he, he recovered uh, well from mild disease. Of course, we need data. And so the Belgian Severe Asthma Registry will investigate this. And I hope many other um, um, national Severe Asthma Registries will do the same to have uh, um, data on, on severe asthmatics and the risk of COVID-19, whether they are treated with biologics or not. But uh, it's an, a very important question. And I only gave a temporary answer uh, because we are lacking evidence at this moment. Yeah. So now we, we, we thank uh, Stephanie for these uh, uh, key questions coming from the patients and from the European Lung Foundation. And so now we go to the uh, Q&A session with, with the audience. And, and so there are many questions, or at least uh, more than 50 already. So, um, so we'll let, let's start with, uh, with some of the questions. Um, may I ask Ali, could we have five or ten minutes more time to go beyond seven? Yes, yes, Guy, please go because, ahead. Because there's uh, a lot of interest and a lot of good questions. Sure, 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 so, sure. Um, yeah, don't worry about the time. We, yeah, we go yeah. ahead. Okay, so... Uh, yes, great, yeah, yeah. thank you. So, um, there's a question, and so I've shown you that uh, in, the, in the paper by... Um, uh, Michael Peters and John Fahey, there's a reduction of the expression of ACE2 in induced sputum in patients with asthma treated with inhaled corticosteroids in a dose-dependent manner. Of course, this is not a randomized controlled trial. It's an observational study. And there's a question, are there differences between ICS type and the effect on the expression of ACE2? So uh, is there differences? Sorry, the sorry, Guy. Uh, yeah. It's from whom the question? So we we uh, and we can okay. answer live. So we the yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's from uh, Omar Usmani. So he's a, a very well known, very well known uh, researcher in the field uh, of of airway diseases. And so um, are go, the go ahead, please. Yeah. Yeah. And so. Uh, it's not known, so we, we need to take, uh, we, we need to investigate this, are the difference between the different inhaled corticosteroids, also the, between the different devices, and, and of course, 
in asthma, we, we try to target the, the, the medicines by inhalation to the airways because the lung parenchyma is, is normal in asthmatics. Of course, in COVID, severe COVID affects mainly the pulmonary compartment, the alveolar uh, epithelial cells. So maybe we should investigate also this uh, by, by targeting inhaled corticosteroids not only to the airways, but also to the lung parenchyma. And there's a, a randomized controlled trial ongoing in France, which is called INHASCO, so inhaled corticosteroids in COVID patients, even in subjects without airway diseases, whether there is efficacy and safety of inhaled corticosteroids uh, in the treatment of COVID beyond patients with, with asthma or, or CPD. Of course, this needs to be investigated. It's, it's ongoing. So, um, um, so it's, oh, it's not, not yet time for the acknowledgements. So I, I don't know what happened. But so uh, can you go back one slide, please? Uh, OK. Maybe oh, I need to. Yeah, OK. I think the take-home messages are the, are the most important, so it showed that. Um, then uh, there's a question by uh, Razan. Does pneumonia vaccine help in avoidance of COVID-19 development? No, um, because it's a viral uh, infection and it causes either a viral pneumonitis or an AUDS due to hyperinflammation, due to an exaggerated host response to the virus. But of course, um, we know that patients with severe asthma are at increased risk of uh, pneumonia, including invasive pneumococcal disease. So at least I um, recommend patients with severe asthma to get their vaccination against uh, uh, pneumococcus, and especially the conjugated uh, pneumococcus vaccine, uh, Prevenar 13. Then uh, we will go further. Um, yeah, are similar levels of ACE2 being seen in those who vape as well as the cigarette smokers? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I don't... From whom, sorry, Guy? From uh, whom? Again, it's, it's from Jess Denning. So from Jess Denning. Um, I'm afraid we don't have any data currently, but uh, it's a very important question. And of course, uh, the ERS guidance on this is don't smoke, don't vape. And because yeah. both smoking yeah. and vaping is, is really uh, bad for your health, respiratory health, cardiovascular health, and there's uh, an excellent review on EVALI, so the Vaping Associated Lung Injury in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, so this uh, should not become the next pandemic of respiratory disease beyond the smoking pandemic we have seen in the last century and the current pandemic of COVID-19. So don't smoke, don't vape. Then uh, Francine Ducard from uh, Canada is asking, uh, so you would say that severe asthma patients are, oh, okay. It's moving. Guy, can you click uh, when you want to answer a question? Ah, can you okay. click, uh, click, click okay. answer live, answer okay. live so it is displayed. So thank you. And yeah. then done so when it's done. Do you see it now? Yeah, normally, the, yeah, yeah. normally participants would see it, yeah. Yeah, so do you see it now? What's the evidence regarding the risk of acquiring uh, or developing severe COVID-19 infection in children with asthma? So um, the honest answer is we do not know. Yeah. But yesterday, there was an interesting paper published in the Jackie um, with uh, Bill Bossi as one of the co-authors and, and uh, uh, Daniel Jackson, who describe again the expression of the ACE2 receptor in nasal epithelium and also bronchial epithelium, uh, especially nasal epithelium of children with asthma, and especially children with allergic asthma, the more they were sensitized to allergens, the less expression of the ACE2 uh, receptor. Again, whether this has implications for the infectivity and the, the cause of the disease of COVID-19, we do not know. So, um, okay, then we go further. 
So what about biological treatments? Uh, so I'll click on it. It's by Pat a question by Patrick Lidlgren. What about biological treatments for severe esophageal asthma? Any recommendation with regard to COVID-19? Currently, the recommendation by NICE and also by Gina is continue to continue, to continue uh, as, as yeah. Antonio also mentioned, mentioned, especially if you have had a patient with severe corticodependent asthma, where you were able to reduce or even stop the oral corticosteroids thanks to add-on treatment with these biologics, then this is, of course, much, much safer, uh, also with respect to the risk of COVID-19. Then there's a question about the role of asthma microbiome in COVID patients. Very uh, interesting, but to my opinion, no data. Antonio, do no you know? Data. No. no data. No data. So I, I, I think there's a very interesting uh, link uh, between microbiome. And so we have a we need a, uh, to, we need to study this this point this topic because uh, there is obviously a, a link uh, between but We have not the data yet. Yeah, and then uh, as already also asked by Stephanie, uh, Elaine Kurtzitz uh, asked the question, what kind of respiratory problems usually post-COVID-19 patients have after discharge from ICU? Um, that we will see the next uh, weeks and months. Eh? Yeah. Um, but it appears that the post-ICU uh, COVID patients, they have really severe, can have severe uh, critical illness, polyneuropathy, myopathy, yeah. uh, and also uh, sometimes uh, pulmonary problems, including pulmonary fibrosis. So we will need long-term follow-up um, of, of post-COVID-19 patients to investigate this with lung function longitudinally, with uh, imaging, high-resolution CT, uh, because there could be, at least in a certain group of patients, um, a persistent um, interstitial lung disease or um, a BOOP-like uh, uh, problem, a bronchiolitis of literans organizing pneumonia uh, problem. So we need to, to follow this. But there will be a post-COVID disease, respiratory disease, for sure. Yeah. Antonio, I think, uh, thoughts? I, I think that uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Stephanie, in Italy, uh, the government are, are, uh, is organizing a, a post-acute uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, 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 patients uh, and uh, they uh, organize uh, uh, training exercise uh, and uh, because because of the, the problem is not only a respiratory rehabilitation and pulmonary rehabilitation but also neuromuscular rehabilitation because they have a, a stenia, they have a fatigue uh, and so I think that uh, we must uh, work together with uh, other specialists in terms of uh, recovery, the uh, respiratory uh, function and also neuromuscular function. Absolutely, Antonio. And then there's a question to you, Ali. So Ali uh, Metsuk is the, the uh, person from ERS coordinating this ERS webinar from Geneva. And so there's a question by Valérie Poirier, who, uh, Will the YouTube link uh, be shared when it's available? So Ali, can you answer this, please? Uh, uh, yes, it will, be, uh, it will be available. All the material will be available on the ERS website starting from tomorrow. OK, yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. Can the severe, uh, then there's a question uh, by Katarina. Can the severe asthma patient go outside for exercise or better not? Exercise is good for, for your health. Uh, and so if uh, it's, uh, there's not a lot of people outside, please go outside for exercise eh? because uh, you need to train your muscles, uh, skeletal muscles, bones. So it's important to prevent uh, inactivity. And, and uh, OK. If it's OK to you, Ani, that we go to 10 minutes beyond 7 p.m. And so that's seven, all good. That's so all good. That's, uh, yeah. OK. Yeah, yeah, uh, Guy, and then uh, please uh, click on answer live when you want to answer an, an, uh, a yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Please. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, there's uh, a question by Margarita Cortese Castro. 
what kind of disinfection should uh, uh, she or he do of the inhaler devices and the mouthpiece uh, after uh, inhaled therapy. So, um, Antonio, can you help us with this question? I, I think that the, the recommendation from guideline is uh, to avoid, if it is possible, to avoid nebulizer because uh, uh, is a, a re, uh, increase the risk of uh, to spread uh, COVID-19. And so I think it is possible for asthmatic uh, to use uh, the, the non device uh, without a nebulizer because uh, 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 we have not the data, but uh, the risk uh, to spread the COVID-19 is very high. Yeah. Then there's for nebulizer, a... for, uh, for uh, spacer, for uh, uh, peak flow meter, so all uh, equipment uh, must be very uh, 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 must be washed uh, and uh, and uh, absolutely not share them because uh, the risk is very high. Or not only for uh, uh, we, we have no data, but uh, we have a risk also to perform a spirometry as well because uh, yeah. uh, I think that uh, all uh, uh, procedures uh, were. Uh, Possible to to have uh, to have uh, 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 saliva or uh, or uh, uh, profound uh, breathless. I think that uh, I think that, that uh, we must uh, avoid. Antonio, you're you're absolutely right. So in spirometry, especially the forced expert maneuvers, they can cause coughing and also yeah. generate aerosols. So this is a high risk procedure. And in our lung function app, we advise that the the uh, lab, uh, the lung function technicians, they wear uh, the use uh, FFX2, mask, they yeah. use masks, the high yeah. protection uh, masks to protect themselves from, from this risk. So, and also the, uh, the nurses and respiratory therapists when they start uh, uh, non-invasive ventilation is another so, yeah. uh, uh, procedure yeah. uh, with a high risk of, uh, uh, to, uh, to spread uh, uh, the infection. And then there's the, the question of the statement by Terry that the British Thoracic Society state that nebulizers are safe to use because the droplets are from the machine, not the patient, and that nebulization is not considered a viral aerosol generating procedure. This is what the BTS states for GINA and other societies uh, is totally different. And within GINA, of course, we are global. We have uh, experience from, for example, colleague Fanny Ko from, from, uh, from uh, Singapore um, and Hong Kong, where there was, from uh, Hong Kong, where they had the first SARS epidemic and they had clear evidence of the spread of the virus, the uh, SARS uh, virus, uh, due to the use of, of the jet nebulizers in the emergency department and in the hospital ward. So we, we have this uh, evidence and uh, experience from the first coronavirus, SARS coronavirus one. So we should be very precau pre uh, precautious and, 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 and so uh, take similar preventive uh, actions to prevent the spread of uh, SARS, SARS coronavirus to uh, uh, true nebulizers. Okay, done, okay. <laughs> So, um, then a patient concerning work. Yeah? So, should uh, it's a, a question by Natalia Kach should patients with mild moderate asthma stay off work during lockdown or should they continue with regular precautions? The ideal, oh, yes. the ideal situation is the in between. So, especially for patients at risk, and then mainly patients uh, who are immunosuppressed, for example, patients with uh, common variable immune deficiencies or transplant patients, they should work by, by telework if possible. So, working from home via yeah, the computer. Smart working is, uh, is recommended. Smart working is recommended. If it is yeah. possible, obviously. And then it depends on, on the kind of work which is performed and whether it's possible yeah. or not to have all the necessary precautions of social distancing and, and uh, hygiene at, at work. If this is not possible, then as respiratory physicians, we should take our responsibility 
and ask for for temporary sick leave for these uh, patients. But but normally, I think most of the time, um, there's a solution by telework or by uh, precautions at work. And so patients with mild to moderate asthma are not at increased risk of COVID-19 if they are well controlled. So oh. done. Right. So we have still one minute. So I think- uh, Guy, uh, Guy yes, sorry. Adi? Yes. If you want to go ahead, please go ahead because uh, I have time and no worries. So uh, it depends on you. Yeah, it is a question by, by Frank Alpers. Uh, what's uh, your view on asthma exacerbations due to COVID-19? Are these potentially different clinically and less responsive to systemic corticosteroids? Again, the answer is we don't, do not know because oh. as Antonio explained, most publications on, on COVID-19 currently are biased towards the severe COVID-19 uh, infections uh, of patients needing hospital admission, ICU stay, mechanical ventilation. So um, is, is COVID-19 a possible cause of mild asthma exacerbations which are treated at home uh, in primary care? I don't know. Antonio, do you have any No, I, I think that uh, when, when uh, uh, we have analyzed the report of four incidents, I think that the, the, the final uh, evaluation of this report is that uh, uh, further studies are needed in this, in particular for uh, outpatients, uh, uh, because we don't know, uh, we have not the data, and I think that uh, is... Uh, absolutely crucial to have a, 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 a very good connection with the GPs in this uh, uh, future, next future, because uh, they have a, a, a lot of data. And, uh, and, uh, and I think that uh, we, for, for the future and uh, to follow uh, the, the possible damage uh, or, uh, the, of these patients, uh, we have to work uh, together with the GP because it's a very good uh, setting uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, future studies. And Antonio, you are absolutely right. So we also need to address this question by Frank Albers. We also need much more testing for COVID-19 yeah. also in primary care, in mild diseases, in milder exacerbations. Because unfortunately in Belgium, we didn't have sufficient capacity to test and so we only tested patients who needed COVID-19 disease. And, and you know, Belgium is among the countries with the highest mortality uh, per million inhabitants due to this lack of yeah. testing in the community. And there was no testing at all in the nursing homes where of course yeah. the most vulnerable uh, uh, patients were. So the, 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 uh, all the uh, patients above 80, 90 years old are extremely vulnerable for, for COVID-19 infection. And since they were not admitted to the hospital, they were not tested. And also the, the nurses and, and the carers working in the nursing homes were not tested. And this has yeah. led to many, many outbreaks of COVID-19 in nursing homes in Belgium. And two thirds of the patients who died due to COVID-19 in Belgium died in nursing homes, not in the hospital, but in the nursing homes. So it's very important that we test more, that we test for COVID-19, not only in the hospital, also in the nursing homes and also in primary care. And then we will be able to answer whether there are um, milder respiratory uh, symptoms and milder asthma exacerbations due to COVID-19 or not. So uh, the, I mean, the, the situation of nursing home is uh, similar in Italy, and uh, I think that it's a, a real tragedy, a real tragedy, because they don't care uh, that, that, that uh, patients, and, uh, and so they have not a uh, possibility to go to the hospital, and also yeah. in Italy. I, uh, I think that we, we uh, have addressed the most important questions. Others we, we will try to, to answer them via email. Um, but I think we, we need to come to an end. Uh, so we always say in academic uh, settings, uh, you can go on 15 minutes uh, or you can start your, 
your teaching also 50 minutes later than planned. But uh, so let's uh, thank, first of all, all the uh, uh, colleagues and patients in the audience for, for attending this session. So we had more than 500 participants at the time uh, during this uh, ERES webinar, which is excellent. I also want to thank uh, uh, Ali Merzuk and, and ERS, the European Respiratory Society, for organizing this uh, uh, webinar so well. And I want uh, to thank specifically Stephanie Eyre as a patient with asthma to provide us these critical questions, very important questions from the patients uh, and to follow an excellent collaboration between the European Lung Foundation and, and, and the ERS. And I want to thank uh, uh, Professor Antonio Spanvello from, from uh, Italy uh, and for being an excellent chair of the most important assembly of the ERS, the Assembly on Airway Diseases on Asthma and CPD. And so uh, to conclude, I will repeat the take home messages. It's that well-controlled asthma is not associated with an increased risk of severe COVID-19. So that's reassuring for patients with asthma that the use of inhaled corticosteroids in subject with asthma prevents exacerbations, is associated with a reduced expression of ACE2, the receptor for the sars coronavirus in sputum. And therefore, patients with asthma should absolutely continue to use their inhaled corticosteroids even during this COVID pandemic, extremely important. Smokers and patients with CPD have an increased risk of severe COVID-19, and uh, we have, and others have shown that the uh, ACE2 receptor is uh, increased uh, in, in the airways and in the lungs of, of uh, smokers and patients with uh, uh, COPD. Of course, COVID-19 impacts all, of, all aspects of our life, but also the, the care for patients with asthma and especially severe asthmatics. And then we urgently ask all colleagues and patients to, to take part of the randomized control trials of either antiviral drugs or immunomodulatory treatments for COVID-19. And I will give you only a few names. So in the UK, there's the recovery trial, a very large uh, uh, adaptive trial for COVID-19. In Belgium, uh, Professor Bart Lambrecht from our department has developed the COF-8 trial. So an uh, excellent trial of multiple immunomodulatory uh, treatments for the very severe end of the spectrum. And then in France, there's the inhaled uh, um, corticosteroids uh, treatment uh, uh, trial for, for COVID. So this is only a few. Uh, there are hundreds of trials worldwide, but we should have sufficient power in each of these trials. So please participate, contribute, and uh, enroll as, as many patients as possible to, to advance uh, medicine and evidence. And as a last slide, so uh, if you can, Ali, give, uh, go to the last slide, please. I want to thank also my collaborators at the Laboratory for Translational Research in, in CPD. Um, we have seen the expression data of ACE2 in the lungs, and this is the work by Ken Bracke, Tanya Maas, Meryl Jacobs, and Sarah Weinand. And I also thank my uh, colleagues at the Clinical Research Unit of the Department of Respiratory Medicine, and especially Bart Lambrecht and Eva van Brakel, who are uh, doing a fantastic job for treating these patients with COVID as, as, as well as possible. And I thank you for your, for your attendance, and, and, and uh, we thank you for the uh, care for patients with COVID and the care for asthma patients. Take care of yourself and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you Goodbye. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much.